Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Colin Thompson, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I guess we should mention how we connected. Uh, you know Mike DiMaggio, and I am uh, related through marriage to Mike. How do you know Mike? So he's Chicago Mike to me because he's the guy at our hometown bar, the Seaview in Cape May, New Jersey. So it's a little neighborhood bar that's a fantastic place that Mike and I are both patrons at. And uh, he always wore the White Sox hat down the other end. So fast forward, uh, rolling through an NFL career. And one of the stops is the great city of Chicago. One of my favorite places, if not the favorite place I was able to play. And uh, Mike and I are roommates. Mike Mike brought me in. Really, the NFL is a ruthless place when it comes to renting and living and, and living in extended stays and truck stop hotels and tr- when you're at the bottom of it, trying to find your way in. And, you know, I still am in a similar situation, but uh, this will be my third year in Carolina. So Mike brought me in when probably I needed it the most. Gave me a room, a house, an awesome place where he lives in outside of the, uh, outside of the city of Chicago there. So you know, Mike's been huge for my career, a great friend, someone that's uh, done a lot for me and, you know, lucky to know him. Yeah. Super solid guy. He's the guy that when we go to uh, a a wedding, because there are a lot of weddings in in their family, uh, I gravitate to Mike every time. (laughs) He's your guy that you're like, after you do all the handshaking and you give everyone hugs and everything's great, but you like look across at Mike, like, all right, Mike's over there. I'll be with him in about 10 minutes. And then you don't move from his side the rest of the, not that I do would ever do any of this and anything we do, but I'm assuming it's very similar. Yeah, well, uh, when it's time to settle in at the uh, reception, yeah, Mike's the guy I settle in. With. Yeah. <laughs> he just sits there like, "Why is everybody dancing?" I got but he's gonna be listening, so that's why I'm talking shit. But he's, <laughs> why, "Why is everybody dancing? Like, this is stupid." Give me another. I'll do another Miller Light. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've I've never seen Mike dance no. ever. Yeah, cool. So, uh, Colin, what are you up to these days? Really traveling a lot. It's been a crazy spring leading up to uh, you know OTAs, off season training that starts in about two weeks here mid-April. So we got married in June and because the season was right there, uh, really we start mid, mid July, mid to late July. So how it works for me is I have a little fun, then have a little fun on July 4th then I shut it down and uh, just get ready, really focus in on, on getting my body ready to go. And then the season happened and flew by and then we did a honeymoon, uh, which was fantastic to the Bahamas, bounced around some little islands there in a unique way. Um, so you know, that was a really, just a really special time for me and my wife and, uh, you know, something I'll, I'll never forget. And then we, tr- you know, spent some time in Key West, Florida, which is kind of home way for home for us. Started my training down there, had some great trips down there with family and friends. And then uh, hit San Diego, hit Panama City Beach, Florida, where we stayed for about three weeks. Uh, so really just crossing some things off the bucket list here as Cindy, Cindy and I settle down and start a family and some things that we wanted to do before that. So, you know, the nice thing about training is I'm able to do it everywhere. So, you know, give hour a day, to, you know, the early part of this real early part of the spring, still winter, and then two hours a day, three hours a day, now up to, you know, four, three, four hours a day training wise. So yeah, just building it up, getting it ready to go, preparing for September and uh, heading into, you know, OTAs here come uh, mid-April. Is it weird to say my wife? It was early. It really was. It's starting to roll off the tongue, you know, earlier. I remember we were at her family's, you know, my in-laws have a great little place in Santa Rosa Beach, right near Destin, Panama City Beach, Florida. And I was like trying to, someone's like, I needed a gate code to get down to the beach. And I forgot the code. And like, well, do you live here? I'm like, well, my in-law, my, I couldn't like say, it was weird. It was like my wife's in-laws, my <laughs> I've been dating Sydney. Sydney and I were dating for eight years before we got married. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we met in college when I was 20. Uh, She was 21, I think, or we were both, maybe both 20. And uh, yeah, we met in college when I was, we were at the University of Florida. Sydney played lacrosse there. Mm. And then I transferred to Temple and we were, boom, long distance after being together for six months. So Mm. saying my girlfriend, Sydney, was really easy and roll off the tongue for eight years. And, you know, we only been married now for about a little, you know, a little over six, seven, eight months, I guess it is. So, yeah, it's been uh, it's been great. But, yes, the wife thing is starting to uh, roll off the tongue a little bit easier. 
All right, right on. All right, so high level working out uh, after the season. What does a typical uh, week look like? Super high level. You don't have to get go into the gory details. And then, and then, same question for what it's like in uh, late July. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's interesting because the workouts they're they're always about the same, but it just depends on what I'm doing when it comes to just the running and the football side of things that changes it. So in late July. Be dedicated, I'll be dedicating you know, an hour to the field time, four days a week. That's running routes, getting on the field, all the sprints, getting used to wearing cleats again. That's a, that's a real thing. You know, getting your feet back used to wearing you – know, foot health has really changed the game. Like I wear sneakers now, like completely flat bottom, open toe, just changing the normal, what our normal – what we think a normal athletic shoe should look like from Nike or whatever brand. They've like turned it almost like a high heel. Hmm. really not great for your foot health. And this is what I'll do on this podcast, folks. So bear with me. I will go off on weird tangents and I will bring it right back to the normal question. So, you know, it, it, it changes. Like get used to wearing cleats again, get used to movement again, get your ankles back to moving again. Cause you train one way and you do so many different things. And thing with football, it's not like basketball where you can just go out and roll out and play five on five or three on three or one on one, or go out and shoot by yourself. Football takes an army of people to really get it going. So, the training camp aspect is huge. The preseason game aspect is huge. The offseason training is massive. We I mean, know that's getting debunked because the Rams didn't have one and they threw all. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting time. But to go back to your question, um, right now it looks like uh, we're looking at probably Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'll lift. I'm changing that now. I'll go Monday, Tuesday, thir- uh, Thursday, Friday. I'll lift. And then I will run – the lift will be either full body or upper body and then lower body the next day. And it will be about uh, – let's see, yesterday was about two hours of a lower body lift, 30 minutes on the bike before it as a cardio session, and then a run home, about a run a mile run home. And uh, just really trying to get in shape, get my body back moving again, get it you know as healthy as I can – you know, the older you get, the more you beat up. This will be my sixth year playing professional football. So you're, you, I still have the same aches and pains, you know, that maybe I had two, three years ago that haven't gone away. But, they're, you know, it's fine. It's a part of playing the game. And, I, you know, it doesn't really hurt me playing-wise. And then, uh, you know, just getting the body back moving again. So that will change. And then we'll go to OTAs. And that's a whole nother can of worms uh, that we can get into. But that grows. And there's limited time you're allowed to be in the stadium in the building, in the facility, based off our union, based off our collective bargaining agreement. So it's a unique time there where you only have like two hours to run and lift. Then you'll have two hours of meetings and that's for two weeks. And then you'll have, you know, an an hour to run and lift. And then you'll have two hours of meetings. Then you'll have an hour of field time with the coaches. And that will be for three weeks. Then you'll start having practices that will start at 45 minutes. Then they go to 50 minutes Then they go to 55 minutes. And they, so it's all done by our union in the sense that it, it builds us up to the season. And then let's see, circle back after that, after some practices in a mandatory mini camp, you find ourselves in June, July, where the you know lifestyle changes pretty pretty harsh in the sense that I'm just dialed in on what I'm eating a lot more. And I pretty I am year round now too, but I'll have some more beers on the weekend, things like that, you know, a little bit more of a of a lifestyle, a weekend lifestyle where, you know, we're out to dinner and doing more of that stuff. But you know, I'll cut all that back in June, July and, and start to really focus in other than a couple of days, give or take. And the training then will be, you know, some field time, some lifting, and then I'll get out and I'll start flipping the tire and I'll start doing some more awkward stuff where I'm kind of jumping and jumping more rope and just doing more things to get my ankles built up and ready to go. So it's become a calculated effort over the years of some things that have worked for me, haven't worked for me. How do I feel when I show up to training camp, et cetera. But the stress is down. Uh, more than it was when I was a rookie. That's for that's for sure. Uh, you know, I don't know how to do it per se. I don't think any of us know how to do it, but we know that there's a little bit better, uh, you know, plan the older you get to attack things. So that's kind of the roundabout way of me talking about how I attack the off season. Okay, cool. Yeah, you're under contract, right, uh, with the Panthers. Uh, it's uh, considered a reserve or futures contract. Is that accurate? <laughs> Yeah, so how that works for those, it's no different than the contract I signed last year, a one-year deal for the minimum. But the difference is I finished here on the practice squad. The last week of the year, I was on the practice squad. So you sign a reserve contract, which is the same as if I finished the year on the active roster, they just call it differently. So 
they you, they sign you to a futures deal or they sign you to a one year deal. That's just how it goes. So it's a unique way of just saying the same thing. Um, yeah. But the last three out of the four weeks of the season, I was on the practice squad. I got activated for the second to last game of the year when we were in New Orleans. Cool. Uh, tight ends are typically either considered blocking tight ends or uh, receiving tight ends. And there's some that uh, excel at both. What would you consider yourself? I am a blocking tight end. If we're going to, if we're going to pigeonhole, um, I am a blocking tight end that can do a little bit of everything. I'm not maybe a receiving at a high level, like some of the receiving tight ends that we know in the league or a receiving at the level, like some of the blocking tight ends in the league that can do it. But I think I fall into the category of the blocking tight ends who can catch balls and run routes. Uh, never had a problem with, you know, per se, knock on wood drops. Uh, I've always had good hands, probably my best attribute when it comes to my athleticism is hand-eye coordination. Um, and, you know, the physicality, the technique, all that stuff's been developed over the years. Foot speed has not been my uh, gift, and I've worked on it, and I've improved it drastically. Um, so that's been awesome. And that has a lot to do with my health, too. Uh, when I was at Florida, I broke my right foot twice, oh. and then broke my left foot, and then got relieved of my scholarship. And that's kind of why I left. Trust me, I didn't want to leave palm trees, my beautiful wife, and all our friends we have. I didn't really want to do that at all. Uh, it's a great school, great education. I had a lot of fun going to basketball games and baseball games and traveling all over the state of Florida and enjoying that lifestyle while playing at a premier football school in the country. You really can't beat it. And then all of a sudden I hear I'm in North Philly, complete opposite situation, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, ended up winning a bunch of games there, 26 games over three years, 10, 10 and six uh, college game day. I think we reached all the way to 15th in the country. And now coach rules, my head coach in Carolina, our head coach in Carolina went on to Baylor did great things there and flipped that program around. And then now we're in Carolina flipping this around. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been quite the journey. Tell me about your relationship with uh, coach rule. Yeah. So coach and I, uh, been fortunate to build a close relationship with coach rule. He's a really smart man, a great football coach, a great leader, me leader, mentor, a friend, uh, yeah, there's a lot of lot to unravel there. I mean, it started with Temple and he come, you know, he said, listen, we're going to give you as much time as you want to get healthy because I was, you know, my feet were fragile. We didn't know what was going on. That was the hardest part about it. We didn't know what the remedy was and it was rest and a physical therapist who's one of the best in the world and Joel Roth, who was at Temple and has since now moved on and, uh, you know, the right plan with him and the patience to say, listen, take what you need and okay, it's. You know, it's two years down the line. You've been in Temple, and it's a Thursday practice. You know, let's put you in turf shoes. Let's put you in sneakers. Let's let's maybe not run you on Mondays with the team. You know, go on the underwater treadmill and get your running in. So his open-mindedness to allow me to grow as a player and stay healthy and participate in games uh, is unique for college football because college football, it's changed a lot. It's more player friendly but it's not a player friendly sport in the sense that there's 120 guys on the team 110 guys on the team so there's an there's another person there ready to take your spot in the nfl there's people to take your spot don't get me wrong but they have to bring them in off the street which i was for a long time come in for a workout you know figure out how that goes fly in run routes hit a bag and then okay you're on the team now you got to figure out the playbook and then go compete for a spot it's craziness it's it's nothing like college football they're completely two different sports really so um, yeah, coach rule has stuck by me, has given me opportunities. I got opportunity in Carolina. I think I took the best of it now going on my third year there and I've you know, established a, a role as kind of the third, fourth tight end, uh, H back position, special teams player. And, you know, some guy that's, I think reliable and, you know, I want to do well by him. I want to perform for him and do the right things. Cause he's done great by me. He's done great by a lot of, you know, us in Carolina. He's done great by a lot of us at Temple and Baylor. And, you know, his former players love him because he is real. He's right 100% of the time, just about 99.9% .9 of the time. And in, in how, you know, you are handling your lifestyle, how you're being a pro. He treated us like a pro when we were at Temple, I thought. So uh, I've been fortunate to, you know, get close with him, spend some time with him in and out of the facility and pick his brain and, and become a better man, father, hopefully down the line. Um, and and really just an overall better football player. How have your feet been since Florida? Good. Knock on wood, I haven't had an issue since my time's at Temple. Um, 
no nicks and knacks. They've got healthier. My wife is a physical therapist. It's had a lot to do with it. We've really, like I said, I've changed my footing. I've done more barefoot running. I probably mm-hmm. run. I want to get to it. Um, one of the cons of traveling so much is there's not a home base per se. There's not a turf field in my backyard. So I do a lot of barefoot running. It helps to strengthen the feet, things like that. So I'm very conscious of my foot health, how that affects my ankles, my calves, my knees, my hips. That, you know, for anybody listening at home, I got back pain. Well, probably maybe a little overweight, one. Uh, two, it probably starts with your feet, your ankles, your knees, starts at the bottom. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been great having a physical therapist, you know, at home who we can talk through these things about. And then also, you know, all the great trainers I've been with over the years that have helped me with different things and chiropractors and physical therapists. And I've been lucky and fortunate enough at a young age to listen uh, be forced to listen even when I don't want to. And it's been, it's been a blessing for me because it's helped me stay alive and continue this game and this professional that I'm very, very lucky to be a part of. And you don't uh, follow the path you followed for football without loving the, the game. What do you love about football? Wow. You know, I get this, I get asked this all the, I think it start on the field, like the pure version of football. There's nothing better than making a play work offensively, making a play work with 11 people you know, an eight yard gain, a nine yard gain, then the film study, the breakdown, the the self-criticism, the criticism by others, the feedback right away. But if you go back to the purest version in sixth grade, I didn't have any of that. I love the physicality of it. I love the competitiveness of it. I love the camaraderie of it. And it's the same at the highest level as it was as Our Lady of Mount Carmel in sixth grade when I was playing CYO football and I was playing center and tight end and long snapper and defensive end and all these different things. And now I find myself in the NFL with these shorter rosters of 50 doing about all the same things, being a scout team defensive end. And I'm our backup long snapper. And I played offensive line for the scout team periods if we're short on offensive linemen and then play tight end and do a little bit of everything. So, you know, I think I love the game because it's the number one team sport in the world. And the ability to protect others has always been something that's drawn me to my you know, the older you get, you look into what, what you were like as a kid and then what you were like as an, what you're like as an adult and now in your profession. And I've always enjoyed protecting, um, or it just comes natural. And then football, you know, we're always protecting each other. So I love that. I love the team camaraderie. I love the respect that comes with it. And then all the things off the field, which come, you know, third, fourth, fifth in line behind all the playing stuff. But, you know, it opens a lot of doors and allows you to really help people allows you to really establish yourself off the field um, in in other professions and, you know, get to do stuff like this. Talk to people like you, get to know new people, go on these different forums and people listen because of the NFL logo and the shield. But 99.9% of the people I've met in the NFL, all the big names, all the people, people label as divas or this or that and the other thing, or they don't like them or they don't know them are all great guys. Uh, You know, starting with, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. that I played with in the Giants. Odell was awesome. Starting with Cam Newton, what I played with in Carolina. Cam Newton could have been a better teammate. So uh, we're all just normal guys. It's all just a microcosm of society. It's just more public and on TV. So, again, another long-winded question with me rambling on. Yeah, no, it's all good. The, the media uh, loves a, a bad guy, right? So they they spin things Love. and make it not look great. Isn't it funny, though? Like Odell, and I, I always tell people Odell's been, it was great to me in New York and great to everybody. He was fine. You know, it was just, he's just, these guys are superstars. It's a whole nother level. People aren't saying good luck today. They're saying, do something for me. Do a backflip, Odell. Catch 15 balls from a punter, right? It's not normal. It's not like, hey, Odell, can you sign this for me? It's like, Odell, like, do something. It was it's weird. It's a, it was just a whole nother dynamic. I saw it with Cam Newton again, too. Like, Christian McCaffrey is one of the best players in the NFL. And when he's healthy, he, I think he is up there with the top five best players in the NFL. Like, he's a star, and he's a superstar, don't get me wrong. But his personality isn't the same as Odell's and Cam's and I'm trying to think of some of the other superstars across the NFL. Like, they people wish – people want the same thing from Christian, but it's 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 a different approach because he's a more mild manner person. But there's people that are excited and jumpy that work in the working world too. 
right? It's the same thing. It's just, this is on national TV for everyone to see. So the Odell thing was funny to get back to what I was going to say is, you know, he's got his arm around some young rookie in the NFC championship game from the team the Rams played. I forget the Bucks and the receiver, right? He's got his arm around him and he's, you know, consoling him. And they're saying, look at the veteran Odell has grown into. He's always been like that. But the media loves it now. He's the hero. It's like the boring topic now. It's like move on from that. And then he gets hurt in the championship game. And everyone's like, Odell Beckham. He's, you know, he's become a pro. He's always been a pro. So, yeah, times have changed. But, you know, people grow up. And another people thing that people need to understand, too, about this league is our tight end this year, Tommy Tremble, came in at 20 years old. Mm. 20. 20. Yeah. 20 years old. Cannot even buy a beer yet legally, right? So, this is, that's a, he's a puppy. I mean, I'm still a puppy at 27, 28. I'm 28 now. Like that's you're, you're trying to figure out life, but your life's now public. So it's it's a unique, it's a unique thing being a professional athlete. I'm not or nowhere near the level of these guys, but uh, I can walk around and do whatever I want, and no one recognizes me. But for these guys that are recognizable, it's a different mental um, picture for them than it is for maybe you and I walking out of down the street in the morning and you're not getting heckled by somebody. Yeah, th- those guys that, that you mentioned, those three, uh, and there are others in the league like that, they can't go anywhere without being recognized. No. Not a, not a single place on earth. No. you keep, Like, imagine like – a, so, like, Christian McCaffrey, we, he has a place up in Lake Norman where uh, – near Lake Norman where Mike used to live when he was in uh, North Carolina and when I lived down there. He can't go to Wal- – you can't just go to Walmart. And you can't just go to the grocery store. Like, everything's got to be delivered to your house. Like, it's a great yeah. story. So Tim Tebow, when I was at Florida, I heard all these stories, right, about Tim. He's a legend, like absolute legend. Like could not go to class, couldn't go. It was a distraction to the university. Like the university deemed him as he cannot go to class because the kids will not. Right? Think about that. Like It's crazy. The university, which is a massive business, statewide, University of Florida, massive, countrywide, really nationwide, and worldwide, honestly. Half the athletes are European or wherever right our volleyball team I'm, I'm rambling on per usual but basketball team people are from all over the place it's an international school and they're saying you cannot go to class because you are a distraction to this entire university we love you so much tim we're going to give you all the support in the world but we can't you can't go so he had groceries delivered he had books delivered he would go in the back door of like study hall to get it to work with a tutor that was like heavily vetted tutor that wouldn't be like hey tim can i have your autograph right it's like I think I literally think some of the people that weren't tutors had to become tutors that were close to Tim because they were the only people that like could be normal around him. And he had to take a cop car with the lights on to practice. He had to get in a cop car go because our practice facility was so the stadium at Florida, the swamp, which is incredible. Anybody who's looking to do college football experiences that has not, especially in the SEC, there's some great ones, right? Alabama, LSU is tremendous. Tennessee is tremendous. I had fun in South Carolina. They're all great. But University of Florida is something. It's really unique. It's a smaller stadium at 93,000 or whatever it is compared to these 100,000. You know, it's still massive, but it's unique. It's unique. Check it out. So, Tim, our practice, our locker room was underneath the stadium. And our practice facility was, uh, our practice facility was underneath. I'm sorry. I'm just straight. Uh, it's a, huge bird to sleep through the window and distract the hell out of me so long story short practice facilities underneath the stadium the uh locker rooms under the stadium excuse me practice facilities about i don't know a quarter mile down the road but you got to walk around the stadium and go up the steps to get there and people could just it's a public university you can just come on campus right you can do anything you want you, the stadium's open during the day too so people come in they run the stadium steps you can't run on the grass but you can be in the stadium hang out people go there and eat lunch do school work mm-hmm. it's cool it's really cool but the quarter mile walk Tim couldn't do it. They wouldn't let him get to practice. He'd get mobbed, tackled. It became a, a health hazard. I mean, think about the teams he was on, too. Percy Harvin. Oh, yeah. Riley they Cooper. Brandon Spikes. Carlos Dunlap. The Pouncey Brothers. Gilbert. Major Wright. All these corner, all these ridiculous DBs. I forget the names of them all. They're so good, all of them. But we're talking five-star type pros and college players. So, I digress. Uh, yeah, guys are different. You can't just walk around the streets and do normal things and norm- live a normal life. So I get why some guys, it's a, it's a stress. It's a mental hurdle for sure. Yeah, I, I can't even comprehend uh, 
being Tim Tebow when he was like what twenty to twenty three. That yeah, and you're unbelievable. He started as a freshman. Him and Chris Leak as an eighteen year old boy. Yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine. I could barely walk out of the swamp with a boot on my foot and in crutches without shaking in front of ninety thousand. And my man's out there taking snaps, running people over. Like that's that's why guys are different. Like that's why when people rip Tebow and said like he couldn't play tight end. Listen. I get it. There's some younger players, myself included, that you could take an opportunity away from. But I truly think if Tim was on the practice squad there for a year and maybe didn't take a five-year break from football, I think Tim could be a tight end in the NFL. No doubt about it. He played quarterback in the NFL. I mean, yeah. this guy gets ripped. I never, I'll never understand it. I'll never understand it. He ended up hitting the ball great for the Mets in the AAA system at one point in time. I think he was hitting high 200s, 300s at one point, a bunch of homers, a bunch of power. Like, this is the guy who didn't play baseball for, like, eight years and just picks up a bat. Now, I get it. He he has a lot of publicity and all these things going around him, but, like, the guy gets ripped, and it's like, wait, the guy couldn't be a better human being. He has, like, prom and charitable, like, galas for kids with special needs. He is a man of – strong man of faith which whether you believe in that faith or not is something to be said. Uh, he is a first round pick. Why don't you want a playoff game in Denver to Mary's Thomas? We all know that play with Pittsburgh right down the middle of the field. I mean, I just, I just never will get the hate for Tim Tebow because what he keeps doing a job and that someone's paying him to do. It's like, Oh, Tim, no, no, your time's up. You need to go back to your, your house and whatever. I don't know. Piss me off. It's a hot button topic with me, man. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, he, he's a, he's normal in a lot of respects. Uh, he's, fantastic in, in other respects. Yeah. And look, uh, the world likes to knock those kind of folks down. And so Tim, uh, he lives with grace and, and that's all he can do. And uh, I, I wish that dude nothing but the best because he was fun to watch at Florida. I can tell you that. Oh, he's a monster guys. Guys, he's, I mean, he's the reason why Florida is what it is today. And that whole team is a team is loaded. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you mentioned the Buccaneers uh, in the playoffs last year. Uh, you scored a touchdown against the Bucks. Uh, in week 10 of what the 2020 season yeah the covid year yeah what well, so that walk me through both playing during the covid year it had to be weird with nobody in the stands uh but also walk me through that touchdown and by the way so I I, think- I, i'm a lifelong buccaneers fan nice nice man nice man i love it i love when fans come up to me and they're like hey man i'm sorry but like go eagles or go box <laughs> i'm like listen like i love it like this is a job you know this is a this is a job for me so I uh, I love all the teams. I love the Carolina Panthers the best. I can guarantee you that, and they have been unbelievable to me. But I love them all. They're one place, and I'd love to play in all those places. So uh, I'm just happy to be in the league, man. I feel, I feel blessed, but neither here nor there. My point is uh, I played in the XFL right before that, and I played for the Tampa Bay Vipers. It was awesome. I had an absolute ball. Absolutely loved it. Excuse me. Tremendous experience. And – uh, played in Raymond James Stadium where the Bucks play their home games. So the league folds. We had our last game actually out in L.A. I think it was the L.A. Wildcats in the L.A. Galaxy Stadium, and then COVID came, and that was it. So and we all know those stories. We don't need to get into the COVID stories. But I uh, fast forward, you know, the f- next September, it's week two of the NFL season, and I'm in for my first play in the NFL, and I'm motioning and. I block down, I chase a beer, Paul, uh, and here comes Christian McCaffrey, and he falls, you know, for a yard right between my legs, and boom, touchdown in Raymond James Stadium. I was just like, this is crazy. Like, I, what? Like, I always thought I'd be here. I knew I'd be here, so I don't want to say I didn't believe I'd be here. But it was a really cool moment for me. That was my kind of first NFL play, other than a couple special teams ones, but my real first offensive snap was that play, Christian's touchdown week two in Tampa. So that was a really big deal. That was Tom's first year in Tampa, Tom Brady. And then, okay, so the touchdown play. Yeah, we, we run a we run a run play a lot. Uh, it's no secret. It's called duo. And uh, it's just double teams to the point of attack. That's why it's called duo pretty much. And, uh, yeah, it's I'm always the wing guy there, the, the wing tight end right off the, the Y tight end, you know, right behind him off the line of scrimmage. For the most part, that's where I played especially that year in 2020. And I just went down and sold the block. That's a play that we've been working on for a couple of weeks now. And we really, it was in the script. It was in our, you know, of what we wanted to run that day. But, you know, usually like, hey, listen, if we get this opportunity, we're going to cut things, you know, that come along with that. But long story short, that was not the case. It 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 got called. 
And my buddy tapped me on the hip, Ian Thomas, who's our starting tight end uh, now this year. And uh, he's like, hey, man, they're calling us. I can't believe it. I said, let's go, man. Let's do it. So I've scored on a lot of these plays throughout my career. It's really the only way I've ever really kind of scored is the, the kind of the decoy blocker and get open. Uh, that's been how I've been designed by coordinators, to, you know, to get myself really wide open because it, it's just I block a lot. So it's an easy way to do the play action. So. I go down, I fake the block, the guy bites on it. I probably did less of a fake than I wanted to, but we do it so much. That's how it goes. The guy just triggered on it, and boom, I just swam him. And the wind was really blowing that day, and the ball popped up, and that's how we threw it every day, and it was a beautiful little rainbow pass that I caught in practice and touchdown. All good. Well, that day the wind was really blowing west to east. So when the ball gets up right above this, above like the first level of seats, the the wind catched, caught it, and it started spiraling like a punt. So everyone was giving Teddy Bridgewater shit. I'm like, that was, the, the pass was fine. I ended up catching it, but it almost got tipped out. That would have been a nightmare. That would have changed a lot of things. But uh, it did not get tipped out by Winfield Jr. I caught it. I squeezed the thing like a punt, and, you know, touchdown hit the ground. I was like, holy shit, I just caught a touchdown in the NFL, man. And we lost that day, which sucked. And I remember sitting on the sideline and be like, I just caught a touchdown in the NFL. Playing Rob Gronkowski – the Bucks, but playing Rob Gronkowski, like he's not going to touch catch a touchdown today. And I just caught a touchdown. Are you kidding me? Like, I'm really a part of this. Like, this was unbelievable. And then fourth quarter comes around. They were beating us, I think, by a touchdown or two at that time. And they were running the ball a lot and they ran the same exact play. And Gronk bluff fake, boom, scored the same exact place, the same exact play. And I said, Well, tip of the cap, brother. Great job. <laughs> the greatest tight end of all time, in my opinion. Um, and so long story short. Yeah, that's the story behind the first touchdown. It was an unbelievable moment for me and my family. I'm truly a product of all the people that I've been able to touch over the years. My family is really well-traveled, been able to get close with a lot of people in all these different cities. And that day, I I called my uncle's bar in Key West, Florida, and bought everyone around a few drinks. Called uh, another uncle, family, friend's bar in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, bought everyone around a drinks, and then called it everybody at the Seaview in Cape May, New Jersey, where we met Chicago Mike and bought everyone around to drinks uh, because, you know, the texts and calls and all the places that everyone watches watching us from were primarily from those places. So, yeah, it's been a special ride. And, you know, to have that touchdown, you know, as kind of a, a public kind of, I don't know, lack of better term, a personal championship uh, is really cool for my family, friends, podcasts and stuff to talk about. Yeah, I mean, think about all the people you've uh, come in contact with just through football from being a little kid playing CYO football all the way up to playing for the Panthers. I mean, they they, they all scored a touchdown that day, too. I guarantee yeah. you. Felt that. Yeah, it was really special. It was special for my family, special for you know, all the coaches that I've worked with, you know, that have helped me, that have worked, you know, that gave their time to me and believed in me and all these different things. So it's – uh yeah, everyone scored a touchdown that day. It was uh, really well said. Are you uh, still podcasting? I'm sorry, broke up there a little bit. You're still, you're still podcasting, right? Oh, yeah, 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 big time. So, sorry. Um, yeah, where do I start? I'll, I'll be on a hopping on a pod at, uh, you know, 1030 here at the bottom of the hour. We'll be going live. I love StreamYard, by the way. What you're using is great. Um, love StreamYard. But we just switch over it from Zoom but we don't need to get podcast nerdy about it. Uh, the, first, the listeners are like, what are you talking about? We're just talking about the forum that you record your podcast from. That's all. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm still podcasting and we're going to media company and doing a lot of different things with it. Uh, it's been fun. So we have not for long media, which is the media company in the apron, kind of like Barstool sports or action park media or whatever company that is a host, right? The parent company. And then we have a bunch of podcasts underneath of it. So we have my podcast, which is actually called Not For Long, but I'll be changing that, making it more of my personal Colin Thompson show, Colin Thompson experience. I don't know what it's going to be yet. We're, we're still brainstorming it, but it's going to be a personal show. Then we have Breaking Bats, which is um, my buddy Brian O'Grady, who plays in Japan. He's uh, played about, I think he played six or seven years in the major leagues, and he went over to Japan this year because of a lockout and a few different reasons. And he's having a great start there, hitting every game but one just raking the ball. We went to high school together and uh, he started a podcast called breaking bats with us. And it's been a hit top 15 baseball podcast in the country. He's nice. having people on like Eric Hosmer, Musgrove, and he's, we played for the Padres. So we had a lot of couple Padres on. I'm trying to forget all the other names I should, but 
just tremendous. Done, they've done a great job. And then we have another podcast coming on with two girls. That's going to be an NFL fantasy sports gambling podcast with two brilliant football minds. Some of the best football minds I've been around. Uh, you know, other than a player or a coach, they're up there with any fan or media member. I truly believe that. And then uh, we have another podcast coming on that's going to be a military podcast. So we're growing the podcast mm-hmm. family. It's going to be a media. It's going to be more of a, it's going to be a military and uh, first responders uh, type podcast. We're going to raise money and, and do different things and get some, you know, entrepreneurial spirit going. But I really want to have a military podcast, pay respect to, you know, people that put their life on the line every day for us and do a lot for our safety and health and first responders. So um, we're working on that. I, th- those two are in the work, in the works. That, that's fantastic. I, I'm a uh, veteran. And so I, I really appreciate uh, you doing that. You Thank can't you for your that. service. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you can't have military folks on enough. I can I can tell you that you can't talk about them enough. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll it's going to be. I spoke to a gentleman yesterday who's going to be our host. I don't know if we release anything yet, but he is highly decorated, still working in the profession, mm-hmm. uh, in an undercover role, which is sweet. And he's going to kind of bring that, but can't talk about it. But has a good way of talking about things. Uh, works in self defense works in a bunch of different things. Uh, so he is going to have uh, military first responders uh, on, tell stories, and then talk about, you know, have no guests on and just talk about, you know, the mental health and the personal and all that. So it's it's great. And we're very lucky trying to probably pair, I haven't even talked to Christian yet, but pair with Christian McCaffrey and what he has going on with 22 and Troops, which he raises money and, you know, does an unbelievable job of bringing awareness to the 22 veterans a day that, uh, commit suicide. So, uh, we're, we're blessed and, you know, there's no, there's no other way to really do it than to give back. So hopefully we can do it by giving back on this podcast in kind of a small form and we'll see where it goes, but it's exciting. It's fun. The podcast world has been great. Everybody has one at this point, which is fun and exciting, but I'm trying to create a, probably a one-stop shop, more of a, you know, a forum for everyone to come in and check out and have a little bit of everything. No, that's fantastic, man. And I, you're having a blast doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know what, it's been really fun, but now I'm getting the business side of things. So that's been unique. That's been unique, right? We're figuring out tax season here. I'm trying to figure out 1099 to W2s and I'm like, whoa, man, whoa, 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 whoa." which is great. And I'm learning, I'm really learning a lot. So yeah, I'm having a blast podcasting. I cannot say I'm having a blast paying these taxes and trying to figure out how to pay them and get everything figured out there. But everything else has been great. <laughs> yeah, this is a hobby for me, man. So I haven't uh, made a single dime off this. And I, I can tell you as a hobby, it's it's probably more relaxing than it is worrying about taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, but, you know, zero complaints for me. Everything's been an awesome learning experience. You know, I should probably finish my master's. I'm about halfway through it. You know, football allows you to get done school early because you're in summer school and you're, you know, they're paying your way. So they're, they're listen, they're, they're taking as much classes as you can take. So I loaded up and, but, you know, instead of going back to my master's, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to start this business and just see what we can do with it. So uh, it's been fun. I've learned a ton. I've made plenty of mistakes. I'll make probably 10 times more. And, uh, but to really surround ourselves and not for lonely with some great people, great hosts is what we're trying to do and been lucky to have a lot of people support it. That's fantastic. All right. Uh, two last questions. Uh, second to last question. You're now a uh, talk show host. It can be any kind of talk show. Uh, you're going to have three guests on. And you get to pick these guests. It's going to be a female, a male, and a musical group or a comedian. Who do you have on? And it's a one-time only deal. They can be alive. They can be dead. They can be famous. They can oh, be wow, wow, wow. Now people. we're going dead. <sighs> yeah, we're, we're going uh, all of uh, human history. Yep. They don't have to be. Wow. Well, I'll have Jason Witten on. He's... You know, someone who I've really looked up to, uh, he's an, entre- you know, he's, he's a philanthropist, entrepreneur, great man, had a really tough childhood. Uh, one of the best tight ends in NFL history. He's the reason why I play tight end. Wow. Man. Female, I'm having my mom on. Okay. No one, nice. knows, no one knows, no one knows publicly about my mom, but she's one of the best um, humans in the world. People know publicly in our communities, but not maybe nationwide. If I had a serious XM radio show that this, you know, this person was my, happens to be my mom. Never said a negative word about anybody. Um, she's a entrepreneur, philanthropist, you know, owns a bunch of retail stores and yeah, she, she would definitely be an unbelievable story. She's a book. 
She'll never write one about herself, but somebody should because it's an unreal journey that she's been through. And then a music group. Or comedian, you're calling, whatever your preference. Or comedian. Oh, man. I think, you know, the first one that came to mind, there's so many. I, I've had, I'm a big, uh, like a, a, really a Cali, re, a Cali reggae fan, which is like a, it's not as like deep roots as Bob Marley, but it's more like an upbeat alternative rock reggae, more like a slightly stupid. So I like Iration and, you know, I've had some really awesome Joe Samba, some awesome people on my podcast that are reggae. So I'm going to shout them out. They're great. But I, you know, what I think I grew up a huge ACDC fan. And I think in their prime, when everyone's healthy to hear some of those stories and what the hell they were doing, you know, I think it's hard to not have somebody on like that and say, okay, I need to hear some stories. What happened after the show? Continue. And just pass them the mic, maybe pass them a beer or whatever substance they're indulging themselves in and let them go. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, there's no band like ACDC bringing a stadium alive, too. They're unbelievable. Yeah, my dad tells great stories about the spectrum in Philly that's no longer existing. And, you know, Angus Young running through the crowd and just punching people in the face because they wouldn't let him get through. And, uh, you know, swinging from the rafters. Oh, only in Philly, man. Only in Philly. <laughs> yeah, because the Philly people, you know, we're all scumbags. And everyone's like, won't get out of the way. And. They're asking him what type, what what he wants on his cheesesteak or something. It's like, dude, just get out of the guy's way. Um, yeah, that's a great question, man. That's a hard hitter. That's a hard hitter. You're gonna have to adapt that and not for long media. So I, I have a co-host. Uh, you're you're more than welcome to use it's it's my co-host. Uh, his question. He's been asking it for a long time. Very cool. All right, uh, let's end with uh, just tell me a little bit more about your family to include Sydney. Yeah. Um, Cindy is from Houston, Texas. So we met at the university of Florida. She was an uh, all American cross player at Florida, absolute stud and, uh, just a great human. And now is a physical therapist and kind of creating a, a geriatric, uh, healthy drink, uh, because she worked in a lot of homes at geriatric care. So she's doing a lot of that. She's kind of transitioning into some of that and then working in PT as well. I have an older brother who was a, uh, six time all American swimmer in high school and was an absolute just stud in the pool. And now is in fashion design, uh, creativity in home design, uh, just an absolute beast, excuse me, and works for my mom and runs the company kind of on her hip and does a lot of that. My dad um, is a college athlete, former college athlete himself and uh, played basketball and uh, had started as a telecommunications company with his father and now has moved on from that, but also works for my mom. It's truly a family business, works with my mom. They're really heavily involved in real uh, real estate, excuse me, the retail world, um, philanthropy, all entrepreneurs. I always tell people our kitchen table talks are probably a little bit different than everyone else's. It's about what house is on the market and what uh, you know next move is for the next store or what do we have to do tomorrow to help mom get you know X, Y, and Z over here. And I lived in 14 different homes within like five miles growing up. Uh, never lived in more more than a house in four years. So it's a different childhood. And we moved in houses because, hey, the market was good. It's time to sell. And there's a house down the street. That's a good price. Hey, we can flip this house and go here. We're going to rent here because the market's high. So that's how my parents operate. It's a little bit different. My mom runs the show, just like a lot of homes in this, in this, uh, in this world. But it was unique in the sense that, you know, dad would be doing, you know, laundry and cooking meals because he would be able to get home by five. You know, and mom would get home and come ripping up the driveway at 100 miles an hour, you know, at whatever, seven o'clock for dinner, because that's mom. And she would go to work, you know, before we would get up in the morning and then come back to eat breakfast with us because we tried to eat meals with the family and really believed in that. And thankfully we did. And then she would, you know, take us to school and then rip back to work. So uh, dad, you know, did a, had an unbelievable role in that, too. So I talked about mom a little bit before, but she's just an absolute rock star and winner and uh, unbelievable, you know, boss. I got to work for her before. I still do in a way, uh, support system mom. She wears all the hats, you know, she's going crazy at the games, waving her hands, get everybody to stand up. Something that she learned at university of Florida. Cause it was funny with the temple. She's like, why is there no one cheering here? I'm like mom, cause this is a losing his program in college football history. We suck right now. And then we, you know, end up turning the page and everything was great. But you know, Florida was like 90s, whatever, 5,000 strong going crazy every weekend, no matter if we play Bowling Green or LSU. So, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate and, uh, you know, to have great family and great friends and a great supporting cast. You're a part of it now. Very lucky to, to be, come across your show and we'll be in touch 
and I'm glad to come on ever, you know, anytime you need me to come on, I would love to. And then, you know, someone like a Chicago Mike and all these different people, it's just, just it never ends, you know, which is so much fun for me. The interactions, the stories, you know, the travel, be able to play and then connect through football. I've been able to meet a lot of great people because of it. So I'm very blessed. Yeah, you 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 are living a, a great life. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best. And I will tell you, I know a lot of folks in the military community. I, I probably know a few folks would be good on your military podcast. And Love it. You're an NFL guy, so I'm probably not going to help you with athletes, but I've had quite a few athletes on too. Hey, I could use all the help I could get. I appreciate it. By, by the way, uh, if, if your mom's up for it, I'll have her on my podcast. I'd love to talk to your mom. She'd be like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> She was like, uh, like TV shows come in, like uh, NBC or like whatever. Your local news will come in from Philadelphia. will come to a show. She's like, I, I just can't. I don't know. I'm like, Mom, what do you mean you don't know? You just, just talk. But I, it's a little bit different for me. I this is why I'm practicing every day in front of the mic. So God yeah, bless. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Hey, Colin, I appreciate you doing this, man. I really do. You didn't have to. Uh, you're you're very cool to do it, and uh, I I wish you nothing but the best, man. Anytime, man. Appreciate you. Yep. All right, you got to go to a podcast. Yeah, we got a we got a. 1030 live stream yard on Twitter. Nice. If you're, yeah, I love stream yard. Stream yard is awesome. It's great. So we'll just go live on Twitter and we're going to talk masters with a guy who covered me at Florida. Does the Orlando Sentinel been doing it for 20 years covering golf. So we'll go on and talk and whatever. And then got another guy coming on. Who's a um, corn ferry, whatever the web.com tour, the one below the PGA. He's going to come on a little later. I think so. Yeah. Running yeah. around, man. That's awesome. Best of luck yeah. to you, man. Appreciate you, brother. All right. See ya. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.